Good morning, everyone, um, um, and uh, welcome back mainly to me. This is the first time I've been back to RGSQ since the start of COVID. Um, we um, we seem to have been troglodytes in um, in Warwick um, uh, since the start of the pandemic, and um, more or less to protect um, elderly um, parents. Okay, um, so um, oh, and someone asked about the noise. Um, the um, that's diamond doves. And if you've been to Craven's Peak or you've been to the Simpson Desert or you've been to Sturt Stony Desert or anywhere in inland Australia, that is one of the continuing noises that you ever hear. Uh, and it's just continuous. Um, and, um, and I thought it was most appropriate as the, as the background. So uh, um, it's funny. Um, how life hinges on the, those improbable events. Because my GPS journey uh, started at, um, at Craven's Peak. Um, I went to um, Craven's Peak as a dog's body volunteer, dig the latrines, um, uh, cook the meals, etc., etc. all those necessary things to support uh, a scientific expedition. Um, but as a result of the circumstances, um, I ended up learning um, a whole lot of new mapping techniques, and I'll explain how that happened. Um, I um, ended up, for a well, um, completely unknowingly mapping a whole stack of the area, and. Um, and 15 years later, um, after a considerable amount of time in the bush, in, uh, I spend the time in the bush and on my computer producing competition maps for orienteering um, based on what I learned at Craven's Peak. Now, ah, so how it happened. Um, during my um, university days and also when I did year 11 and 12 geology, I was taught plane table mapping, compass and tape mapping, compass and pace mapping, if it didn't have to be all that accurate. And while I was teaching earth science at Warwick State High School uh, for 30 odd years, I taught those simple processes, those simple procedures to my students because they are simple. They're relatively accurate, as accurate as people really need to be, and they use everyday apparatus. It's nothing, um, nothing particular. Um, and in fact, about, oh, I suppose a half a dozen years after this particular student had left high school, she wrote to me um, and said and thanked me because she would got a surveyor to mark up her, the property that she and her partner were buying. Um, and he'd quoted her an extra fifteen and a half thousand uh, dollars, which in 1990, ooh, uh, Rachel, 1995 or so was a considerable amount of money to contour her block so that she could give that to the house designer. And she said, no, well, she could use the, um, the old um, plastic tube to level her property and did so with a partner and saved herself the money and uh, uh, from the, the really simple survey techniques that I taught her when she was in grade 12. So um, <clears throat> how it happened. Um, I volunteered to be uh, to go and do the, um, the housework at Craven's Peak. But uh, in one of the missives that Paul Fe uh, Feeney sent out, um, I noticed that um, Don Eastwell had been labelled as, as the geological researcher to do a geol survey. So I gave him a ring, uh, being a bit interested in the subject myself. Um, and um, he eventually uh, rang Paul and asked if I could accompany him. Um, and because Don was fairly old, even at that stage, he's since died, um, uh, if, uh, if but it became a safety thing as well, particularly in the more isolated areas of Craven's Peak. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> and that's what I was at Craven's Peak for, for the, um, um, 
the housekeeping, the um, to support the geology and also to um, to do some photography. However, um, <clears throat> I realised that the old mapping techniques that I was used to just wouldn't cut it in the broad open spaces of Craven's Peak. And so uh, knowing that there was this thing called a geo geographical positioning system, what's that? Um, I decided that it was worthwhile um, <coughs> worthwhile um, um, uh, looking into it. So I borrowed a, um, uh, a fairly decent GPS from a friend of mine, Jeff Billings, uh, a late member of the society. Um, and um, I had a bit of a play with it. Uh, before we went, but I hadn't really done, uh, expected to do any mapping because Don was the researcher and I was just the knowledgeable sidekick. So how I went about it for a start. Okay, now a lot of my talk is going to be, to, follows my diary and field notes uh, from the Craven's Peak adventure. Um, Gil and I started pretty well. You know, that's us camped at Mitchell on the way out. Okay, but uh, then the country got drier. Okay, <laughs> and the accommodation wasn't really five star. No, you wouldn't. And, um, and the telecommunications were even worse. Okay, until we got to Bullia uh, beside the Burke River, and that looked like a veritable paradise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But it was short lived because rain had made, made all the roads untrafficable. Well, at least the ones from Bullia. And so, therefore, the plan was to come in from the Badurian. So, we all up, up sticks and out of Bullia and down to Baduri, right? And down went the standard of the accommodation. Okay. Okay. So, uh, this is my Marriott International a la Baduri. Okay. At least the stay was pretty pleasant, okay, made so by the artesian pool, naturally heated, by the air-conditioned library, and uh, by the, the friends that uh, my fellow travellers. Um, there wasn't much of the metropolis of Baduri and Environs that we hadn't seen before we left there. Um, but, you know, as the country in Western Queensland does, it dried out, and the roads dried out. Well, some of them. Uh, so which one dried out? Oh, the one from Bullia, of course. So back to Bullia we all went. Okay. So um, this is the um, this is the work area uh, of Craven's Peak Station. Um, a lovely oasis that it was. It was pretty good. Uh, and that's the um, the view from the door on the back of my room in the Donga. But um, after Baduri. Uh, the accommodation was literally palatial. Okay, I even had a desk to put the computer on and um, and and assemble assemble samples. Okay, so um, I'm now taking um, extracts from my diary, um, my diary of the Tuesday of Tuesday the twentieth of March two thousand and seven. Quote: The intention was to depart the next day for a three day run to set up the outstation camps. We packed the trailers. By T, the tracks to the outstations had been investigated and found so bad, so the sortie had to be postponed one day. I digress a moment. John Casey was a respected field geologist and paleontologist um, for, uh, back in the day, and I'd, um, I'd met him. I saw uh, at some stage at a conference, I'd, uh, I saw in the literature that he had actually done the broad scale geological survey of the area in the 1960s for the then BMR, the Bureau of Mineral Resources. And so therefore I gave, gave him a ring and had a chat and he very kindly sent me a copy of his field notes. So uh, looking through the field notes, they said nautiloids, well, you all know what a pearly nautilus looks like. Okay, um, they're the same sorts of things, except that 470 million years ago, when this, these rocks were laid down, they're all straight, but that's not really a, uh, really a big deal. Palecopods, oh, palecopods are just bivalves, you know, things like ugaries and pippies and mussels, which open like that. 
and brachiopods. Now, brachiopods are just about all extinct these days. I think there's one species still in the Mediterranean. They're a bivalve, but instead of having two, a right and a left-hand valve, they've actually got a bottom, a dorsal valve and a ventral valve, which are quite different in shape. Okay, so that's fine. That was all okay with the uh, paleontology that I'd done in my geol degree. And then I read on and John's notes said, problematica. Now, I'm really a geochemist. Okay, my expertise area is in the chemistry of the formation of metal sulfide ores. If, um, a if a respected paleontologist is saying about the fossils he's seeing, they're problematic, then I have an enormous problem. So that evening, the evening of the, and I go on with my field note, my, my diary, after tea, I looked at the fossils in the dining room with the field notes. A what on earth is that moment? <laughs> okay. Next day, I arranged with Joe, one of the Bush Heritage staff, uh, to show me some of the fossil sites uh, fairly close to the homestead that she mentioned to me. So I took the GPS. Ah, first mention of GPS. I took the GPS just on spec, um, and, um, uh, and had a look around, kept pressing a few buttons, okay, and then when I came back, thought, mm, I better set up some sort of system, otherwise I'm never going to know what's going on here, okay, um, by putting what I'd seen and a number, this particular, um, this particular GPS called them points of interest, POIs, a, a POI number, a coordinate, and what I'd seen in the place. And that actual basic setup has um, served me in good stead. So <clears throat> at that stage, um, Thursday the 22nd of March, the tracks had dried out sufficiently on the, for the run up at 5.30, weather fine and lot, hot, lots of flies, Jupiter, Mars and Mercury in the sky, early breakfast, packed cars depart at 9.25, set the GPS to remember the route. Next step. Okay, out of Craven's Peak to the north, on to Glen Ormiston Station across Mulligan River, well down on Tuesday's level, parallel to the Mulligan on stony and sandy country, back across the Mulligan, up onto the rocky plateau and along the boundary fence to S Bend Camp. And I thought Baduri was rough. <laughs> the unfortunate part about it is also hot. Uh, somebody had a thermometer which was placed on the lunch table underneath the tent there and it was registering 55. And this at Easter time, yes, okay. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I can tell you, digging latrines, uh, even with an auger, was uh, really hard work. Okay. And what's more, that's my little, um, my little bivouac. And what's more, it rained at 2 a.m. <laughs> okay, so um, we set up the, that and then up the next morning, packed, for, packed the camp, secured S-Bend camp from feral camels. Um, and uh, the weather's cool and cloudy, no flies, much better day. Um, GPS seems to be working, although it's a bit difficult to test because I'd actually left my um, my computer out at the uh, uh, back there. I wasn't going to take it uh, uh, where it might um, come to grief. Um, so therefore, um, back across the boulder field, across the mulligan, over and down some jump ups, uh, across the sand plain, parallel to the old dingo fence and into Salty Bore. I saw some planes, what planes wanderers. That was a real uh, a real um, um, high point of the day. Now, Salty Bore is in a re-entrant between two rocky ridges. Uh, it's red sand and fair grass area. Okay. Um, there's a bush shelter. Okay. It's much nicer than Espen. 
and the setup was much quicker because we were a bit practiced by that stage. And also, um, it, uh, there were some of the facilities. This brush shelter was uh, was was able to be ju just had uh, a tarp thrown over the top, and there we had a shelter. Okay, but um, uh, it was still quite hostile. One of the things that really struck me at the time is in the middle of this absolutely hostile country like that, which is just towards the, that photo is taken just towards the top of the Mesa, which overlooks uh, Salty Gore. There are these fine purple succulenty telotuses just growing out of what looks like rock. Unbelievable how um, how paradoxical some parts of the Australian bush are. Okay, still hostile. Um, over lunch, I compared my, my GPS, bottom of the line, with Len's top of the range model, and we found two metres difference. Huh, two metres, middle of this? Who cares? Okay, so we now drove home, more or less on the same route, and I followed the route I'd stored two days before on the GPS and found that it worked out really well, functioned like a charm. Okay, Sunday the 25th of March, up about 6.30, weather cool, when the overcast but clear to the south. Breakfast, then organising, dismantling, fixing pallets for the toilets and the shower stands. Um, I went for a walk with Jane, Sue and the McGraths, who are on that there. Um, around to the close sites using the GPS points that I'd picked up the previous Tuesday. And I found that that worked really accurately. It brought me dead on to those interesting sites. Um, and then I found lots of good samples there and established the extent of the two most fossiliferous sites. And uh, also did some washing. <laughs> the flies like the water. <laughs> okay, Monday. I tried to ring Peter Pridmore. He was the geologist that was coming in with the second tranche of, um, of researchers, um, uh, but I couldn't get on to him. And because of the tracks, there weren't going to be any scientists in for at least a couple of days. So I decided to do just a little bit of preparation work for the geol. Um, most of the preparation work, uh, getting ready for the um, the outstation camps had been done by this stage. Uh, now there was an, some electrical work that was being done, but uh, I'm not um, I'm not that way expert, so therefore I wasn't really required. So I departed about nine nine a.m. and lunch when water in the bladder. Uh, that's the one on the back of my pack. Um, I walked south for about fifteen kilometres along the dingo fence. Uh, locating fossils. And there are gazillions of them in the middle of this dry um, Simpson desert. It is just scattered with marine fossils. Unbelievable. Okay, so um, the rocks are absolutely full. Now, um, or on this little one at the bottom right hand, all of that white stuff is fossil material. Shells, um, of various types. Um, there's um, there's um, uh, the nautiloids there as well, and there are other things as well, which sort of gave me an idea of what was the uh, what was the um, uh, the go 470 million years ago. Um, by the way. When you get a limestone like that, uh, forget about the red color, that's just a bit of iron oxide. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, uh, when you've got that sort of shelly limestone, it's actually given a particular name. It's called coquinite. Uh, and you'll, and after this, I'll just let that name run. Okay, now um, <clears throat> uh, the, the fossils were of um, two particular types. Okay, now this is a snail-like thing called graphostoma. Um, but instead of a spiral, okay, it's a plenty spiral, if you get my drift. Um, uh, looks more uh, like some of those um, those um, flat uh, spirals that you get on, uh, on seashores today. Um, and, um, and now, um, 
I have to figure out how to work this one. Where are we? Uh huh. Okay. And I get it on for the. Hmm. Okay. That's not working, Lilia. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, excellent. Okay. So this is Raffia Stone. Oh, this is interesting to work. Okay. Can you see this net thing just to the left of that? Um, of that? Yeah. That's a sea fan. Okay. And so sea fans, bottom dwelling, bottom dwelling um, things. Aha, we've got shallow water here. A fairly obvious. Okay. Does that stay there? And we've got some interesting stuff. We had some very large gypsum crystals just growing in the soil. Okay, worked rather well. Okay, now, uh, yes, good, it worked. <laughs> okay, so gypsum fossils, uh, uh, gypsum, uh, and we had funny green rocks. Okay, now funny green rocks start to come up a little later. That really isn't a funny green rock uh, because of all the rain we'd had. We just had algae growing, on, but the um, but the contrast between the green of the algae and the red of the rocks is just makes it startling when it just sits out there by itself in the middle of the gibber. Okay, and um, um, went to lunch. Yes, this is the first in my series of scenic lunch spots. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> okay, so. Hello. Okay, don't know why that happened. It's fine. We got it. Um, <clears throat> okay, now the fossils eventually dis that I was following eventually disappeared under a bit of sand plain. Um, now, bear that in mind because that becomes important for my use of the GPS uh, a couple of days hence. Um, Anyway, uh, about 1 p.m. Um, I had uh, lunch. Wait a minute. We need, we need to go through that to my nice lunch spot. Good, nice lunch spot. Um, about 1 o'clock, about 13 kilometres south of the homestead. Um, views um, weren't too bad. Um, to the west, you've got large lagoons in the swales between the sand dunes uh, and lots of water bird at that stage. And um, to the east, extensive stony plains. Okay, so 27th of March, still no scientists. They still couldn't get in. The roads are still too wet. So I decided to work walk north today. Um, early breakfast and away about eight o'clock at lunch. I rechecked the, the uh, extent of the red fossil beds. Uh, that I'd seen a couple of days before. Now, um, I also, and so that's the red beds there, and though that's, oh, by the way, that um, shape there that you can see beside my hand lens um, is actually the top valve of one of these brachiopods, okay? So that's what the shape looks like. Um, but I'd established that there's actually at least two types of rocks here, okay? Now, um, <clears throat> the red uh, fossil beds that I'd, um, I was, I'd already talked about are in the foreground, covered by some fairly dark gibber. But then immediately above that and younger are the gray, the gray rocks. Oh, I see, I have to do that, do I, each time? Okay. Um, oh, ah, there it is. Oh, excellent. Oops. Okay. Can everyone can everyone see the grey um, the grey different rock at the base of the hill? Yeah. yeah. The the red fossiliferous rock is in the gibber down below, and then you've got the grey above it. Okay. Now I said it was younger. The thing about sedimentary rocks, of course, is stuff gets laid down and then later stuff gets piled on top. And so we have a, a law in geology called the law of superposition. If it's on top, it's younger, okay? Rarely you get it overturned, 
but usually that takes enormous earth forces to do it. And there are other indications like microstresses and fractures in the rock and recrystallization that'll tell you, that will give you an inkling. Uh, things aren't as straightforward here, like it is down south of, um, south of Warwick where the silverwood beds uh, are actually turned over in the Rosenthal, uh, Rosenthal Creek Foundation, Foundation. But anyway, this was dead obvious. It's just about level. And so therefore none of this overturning had gone on. There are actually all three of the, um, of the sections that I had identified. There is this one at the bottom, which is the oldest, the red stuff. There's the gray stuff there. Then there's the red stuff, more of the similar red stuff above, but at the pointer, can you see a division line? Okay, above that is uh, a pretty boring, uh, fine sandstone without anything in it and no real indications of what sort of environment uh, called the Carlo sandstone. And that's just sitting on top and that's as hard as all get out. And that's what makes the plain which Craven's Peak Station is sitting on top of. And I've come down below before it in age. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> because it's around Craven's Peak, I decided to, to label these three levels, Craven A, Craven B, and Craven C. And your reaction is the first time anyone's ever seen the smoke and mirrors. <laughs> ah, well, okay. So um, <clears throat> now- um, It shows our age. Is that, yeah, it probably does too. I still remember the red and white packets. <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, um, I followed, um, uh, so yeah, so I've got Craven A as the oldest. Oh, throwing it away. Oh. Uh, so you've got Craven A as the oldest, and it's a red bed. Craven B, which is grey, and it's a coquinite mainly, and then Craven C above, which we go back to the red type fossil beds. Okay, so um, followed the um, <clears throat> uh, followed the uh, Craven B uh, for about five and a half kilometres roughly northwest until it disappeared under a sandhill. Lunch under a shady Gigi tree about seven kilometres from home. Um, uh, masked wood swallows, budgies, crimson chat came to investigate. Okay. Home via the stony plain. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realise just how hostile some of this country could be. Um, unbelievable. And, and, it, and it, it's just extensive. It just keeps going and going and going. Okay, <clears throat> so I arrived back about 3.50 after 20 to 25 kilometre walk and uh, talked to Keith Hall about way, my waypoints that I might, points of interest that I'd picked up and his mapping software that he developed uh, so that we could actually pinpoint people because the Northern Sim the, the Simpson Desert is a part of Australia where it is, it is dangerous. You have to be careful. If you get separated, if you get lost, then there are very real dangers. And so therefore he had some mapping software to keep track of where everyone was. Um, so I, decided, okay, I'll have a go. I'll put all my fossil points onto his map of the place. And I put them as little triangles and it works. In fact, it's incredibly accurate, okay? If I've got a coordinate and a notation that that coordinate is on a creek, a road or a tra or a, um, um, or a, um, a fence, then the point is always on a creek or road or a fence. And, that, and, and this on a map that is completely unallied to any geology map. Voila, it works. Now, I know what, and now all what I've been saying so far sounds a bit travel loggish. But I'm trying to give you an idea of my very well organized GPS education. There's no planning, right? It's completely random. If I read something in the destructions, then I try it and hope. Okay, once again, no scientists. So up early, 
Um, heavy cloud on the south, southwest horizon. Oh dear, not more rain. Okay, out about eight o'clock, showed K2, that's Keftees, a close fossil sites, and then to the south end point of the northern section of Craven A, where I lost it yesterday. Okay, after a couple of points, it became almost impossible to find. It was disappearing under these sand dunes. And so I had read the previous night about projection. Now, projection is where you uh, spot in three or four points and you then project on the same bearing to, to, uh, to, uh, which will show up on your GPS so you can just follow that as a route. And so I kept on that last bearing and picked it up again about one kilometre further up the further up after it disappearing. OK, about a one kilometre gap. So another part of my education was complete. OK, uh, morning tea after um, closing it. And um, oh, that's still there, isn't it? OK, um, and this is my, uh, once again, scenic morning tea site um, <coughs> amongst the sand, uh, the sand plain. Um, many chats and zebra finches. Um, and, um, uh, and then back about 3.50 or so uh, after uh, finding the, a few extra fossils along the way. OK, so um, <coughs> I ended up about Oh, uh, probably 20 kilometres that day. Um, along the way, I came across uh, a strange greenish sandstone, fairly fine. Didn't look like much, but decided, oh, that's quite different. OK, so logged it in. Um, I had actually seen something similar a couple of days before, but not really twigged that it might be important. Anyway, OK. Put the remaining, when I got back, put the remaining GPS points uh, onto Keith's computer and looked all good. And it also looked, when I started trying to compare it to the geological map that I had from the 1960s, um, it looked pretty consistent, not too bad. Um, helped to move a cold room into the homestead, which had been constructed on site. Okay, and John and Mary, and Mary will remember trying to inch that cold room into the side of the house uh, and it just fitted. It was really well cut. Anyway, so um, uh, that was one of the, the fun parts. OK, so a pattern is starting to emerge from what I've seen on the ground. The first thing is that the lithology, the, the actual characteristics of the rocks, is that it's fairly fine. Now, fine sediment means fairly calm conditions either a lake or a lagoon or an embayment of the ocean, something like that, where there's not too much current and not too much waves. Okay, so no problems at all. Okay, so this is one of, but what I found also is, can everyone see, now I need, there are little black dots scattered all the way through. OK, when I look more carefully at those, they're hematite, iron oxide. Now, for the first uh, couple of thousand million years of the Earth's history, there wasn't very much oxygen around in the atmosphere. And so therefore, while nature was dissolving all sorts of stuff out, and out of the rocks and eroding it and dumping it in the oceans, iron stayed in solution. But as soon as plants started building up the oxygen levels, that started to oxidize and you had a chemical precipitation of hematite in the oceans. For a thousand million years, our oceans were pink. And there's this gentle rain of hematite crystals down through the oceans as the enormous amounts of iron that are sitting there, we're an iron rich planet, um, uh, as this iron came out of the oceans. However, chemical precipitation, they ought to be crystalline. They ought to show crystal crystal faces, like just like growing you know salt crystals in a in a glass on in your kitchen. But none of these are. They're all rounded. Now, I'm sure you all realise that if things are rounded in nature, then uh, and they should have sharp faces, then something's rounded off, just like the cobbles in the bottom of the uh, of the stream bed. 
And so therefore, these crystals have been moved backwards and forwards. Now, they can't have been moved very violently, otherwise it wouldn't be uh, a fine sediment. And so therefore, this has to be a calm environment where something's just gently moving the, uh, the crystals around. And what that means is that we're in really shallow water and the crystals are being moved by, they're being at what we call wave base. Now, wave disturbance doesn't penetrate very far down into the water, about half the actual distance between the wave crests. And so therefore, the waves are just gently, uh, gently um, moving these backwards and forwards, rounding off the crystal edges, in and it has to be in shallow water. So shallow water, calm, and then the rocks break themselves more or less into three types, as I've already said. An older Craven A section, which is red, uh, a middle section, which is mainly gray, which I'd call Craven B, which is mainly coquinite, and a Craven C section, which is once again, the red ones. Um, but there are a couple of things here. Okay. Um, I've already talked about Raphistoma, okay. It's a planispiral snail, snail type, okay? So is Tychospira, although it's a spirally, it's a spirally gastropod. And if we come down, I've listed animal traces down here in this particular sample. Oh, this isn't all my waypoints. I've just made a selection of ones where I've got uh, sufficient uh, detail to show you this. Um, animal traces are worm borings, okay? Now, uh, <clears throat> We, excuse me, we have um, uh, lots of worms bore in the uh, tunnel and separate out organic material that's got mixed up with the mud um, and, um, and they leave behind their, uh, their tunnels in behind. Sometimes in this case, the tunnel bore, the tunnels get infilled later on and, the, um, uh, and that preserves uh, details of the animal um, sort of second hand. But snails and also I suppose bivalves and worms are at the surface. So we're talking fairly shallow. Now I've um, labelled all these surface ones with a yellow highlight. And you'll see that those that they go right the way through all of this formation. However, there are others. And so therefore, if you come down, for instance, to Actinoceros, Actinoceros is an active, free-swimming um, nautiloid. It's a predator, okay? Much like a cuttlefish is today. And so therefore, this is, this is free-swimming. And what I, I've done is I've now highlighted the free-swimming species that are found. So in addition to this being shallow, close to wave base, calm, it seems that our coastline is migrating. We start with something that's very shallow, which shows only bottom dwelling animals and therefore Craven A. And then the coastline goes away a little bit, perhaps to the west, I think, and the water becomes a little deeper, allowing the free swimming uh, uh, animals to come in. And then once again, after Cra for Craven B, and then after Craven B, the coastline migrates back towards Craven's Peak itself, so that once again, we only have the bottom dwellers. And so therefore we've now got calm, shallow water, close to wave base, migrating coastline, building up a picture of what was happening in Craven's Peak around 470 million years ago. Okay, stepping forward today and the scientists have arrived. Hey, we can go and do some, um, and, and Don can do, do some work. Okay, right. <clears throat> so 12 mile camp uh, where we met Mary. 
I think it was. Yeah, it was. A, it was a trial by, wasn't it? Okay. Uh, weather clear, warm. Departed eight thirty for Painted Gorge. Okay, which is an interesting place. A breeding pair of wedge-tailed eagles and a dead tree close to the track. Impressive cuestas. Now, a cuesta is just where you've got a hard band of rock that sticks up uh, like those there. Okay, um, and um, and it gives you good outcrop. Okay, um, we um, entered entered Painted Gorge from the east, drove right through about 300 metres to the oldest end. That's the west end. Okay, once again. Okay, at Craven's Peak itself. Okay, I'm looking at rocks which are very slightly sloping away to the west. Once I've got to Painted Gorge, I find the same rocks. But they're sticking up this way and, stip and dipping quite de steeply to the east. What's happening here? Aha, okay. We have a bowl shape, a, um, um, a, what, what's called a syncline. And I can pick up the same rocks here as I could uh, on the other side of the property. Oh, by the way, we're fairly close to the Northern Territory border here. Dearly love to go a little further because a little further, um, behind, um, to the west of Painted Gorge are the Hay River beds. Now the Hay River beds are the same age and environment as Ediacara Hills in South Australia. Unfortunately, the tracks there haven't been maintained for years and years and the Bush Heritage told us, no, we prefer you not to go out there. I would have loved to have found some of those fabulous fossils that they find in the Ediacara Hills. Now, everyone knows what Ediacara is? The first multicellular life on Earth. Absolutely fabulous. I wish I'd been able to get down there, get there. Anyway, there was the breaks. Uh, Australia's too big. Okay, so um, Don found worm casts immediately. Okay, so here's a worm cast, right? And you might say, oh, yeah, okay, what happens? The, the worm pushes its way through the mud, okay, and leaves behind a tunnel. Something comes in, infills the tunnel, uh, and it could be, in this case, harder than the original rock that was around it, and the, that original rock gets eroded away, and you're left with just the worm cast. But it does actually tell you quite a lot. Can everyone see um, down particularly, uh, where's the one, I know, particularly here, that there seem to be little stripes across the worm cast? Okay. And here, and to a lesser extent, we might be able to see that there. Okay, this tells us something about the worms, okay? Because if you think about an earthworm, what an earthworm does is he wants to push forward, so he fattens up his rear end and pushes his, pushes his front end out, and then fattens up the front end and drags his rear end up behind. But he's a segmented worm. And so therefore, all those little rings that you've got around an earthworm pressed up against the outside of the wall leave the impression. So this is the worm cast of a segmented worm. It's not a primitive worm, like a, a flatworm or a leech. It's a bit further on with all those little segments. So it tells us something about what, uh, what sort of stuff is romping around in the mud at Craven's Peak. Okay, so uh, Don uh, wanted to find uh, wanted to find that he's re he was really interested in the um, uh, in the worm casts. Okay, um, I, I wandered off and uh, kept kept looking at the particular rocks that uh, corresponded to the ones over on the east side of the property, um, and uh, and found a couple of impressive. Uh, uh, I had some lunch. Okay, he stayed, he's, yeah, no, that's not lunch, but um, he stayed still in, in the hop. He stayed still enough for me to take a photo. Okay, and back to camp, okay, and uh, that's um, that's 12 mile, Mary, okay, at night. And I had a go at some astronomy photography. Okay, everyone see the paradox in the photo? Seven cross. Yeah, the Southern Cross is there, and the pointers, yeah. Okay, okay, and I've got actual stars, but the landscape is visible. Okay, it's taken at Gibbous Moon. It's off to the, the moon is off to the left, and because the moon reflects sunlight, 
uh, if you leave your, your shutter open for a while, it looks as though the sun's up um, and you can see both the landscape and the star trails. It was, um, was one of my successes while I was there. Okay, sticking forward a few days. Uh, Salty Boar Camp. Uh, the weather's now consistently clear and warm and quite hot. Um, I decided to uh, look at the ridges to the south and I found these Kaleki pods. Okay, now. Um, the name of this particular um, bivalve, okay, it's related to the mussels, it's called an Oceramus, okay, and it's called an Oceramus back uh, 470 million years ago, and it's called an Oceramus in the Jurassic uh, uh, perhaps about uh, 200, and 200 million years ago, and it's called an Oceramus uh, about 60 million years ago and about 40 million years ago. And it can't possibly be the same species. No? Well, not in biological terms. That's because the biological definition of species and the geological, uh, paleontological definition of species are completely different. In biology, it's what reproduces with what else. But we can't see that with things that are, are in rocks. So if it looks the same, it is the same. And they're called bucket species. Okay, things that look the same are all tossed into the same name, but they can't possibly be the same species. But we recognize that. I uh, kept going to around the south and found this. And that's, that's the track of a trilobite across the mud. Now, trilobites have got three parts trilobite, okay, a head, a middle abdomen, and a tail called a pygidium. Okay, and they've got spines, or many of them have got spines on, but their appendages that they use to move themselves around are actually sort of like the legs of a crab, and they do this to push it along. And so therefore, the things that you can see here, these diagonal stripes, that one and that one, and then these three down here, that's where these little appendages dig into the mud, and these parallel stripes here is where the spines are dragging along uh, on the underside of the animal. Okay, and I have, and the literature said that there weren't any, well, no trilobites had ever been found in the Nora Formation. And this is my first, the first, um, first um, indication that there are trilobites here. Okay, so that was a real, uh, a really important um, point. I got inspected by a dingo at about 40 metres. Okay, he was very wary. Okay, and um, he got to about there and hadn't seen me. I was actually sitting down looking at a rock, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, and I saw, ah, and went clip. And unfortunately, my SLR goes clunk. <laughs> so the years go up, he looks at me and then skirts me at obviously his approach distance. But um, he, he wasn't afraid of me, uh, but he certainly was wary. Okay, so um, um, then uh, at that stage, on the, by the 9th of April, we're going back to the homestead via Plum Pudding. Okay, that's Plum Pudding Mesa, um, one of the more um, obvious mesas on the property. There's lots of them. I'll get to that a little later. Um, <clears throat> Took a, a bit of a drive with K2, David Carstens and Bruce to, um, to sites 38 to 41. Okay, found a good nautiloid. And this allows me to identify the nautiloid down to species level. Um, this in the middle here is the living chamber for the animal. And these are the now untended chambers here. And in there, I can see enough detail to, to tell me which species it was. And in here, there's enough detail of the, uh, the sheets of calcite that the, the animal uses to anchor the soft body to the shell. Okay, so this was a really, a really good find because I could really get it down to, um, to species level. Okay, um, day of departure. Um, I, um, um, I had been thinking about this funny green sandstone. Okay, it had been preying on my mind actually. And so therefore on the morning of departure, 
I decided I'd go out and have another look at sites three and thirty where this rock um, where this rock actually outcrops. Um, it was still quite dark when I left, and um, I was getting close to site three. And quails do what quails always do: they wait until you almost stand on them and erupt out of the undergrowth uh, and give you the hell of a scare. Okay, but I've fancied it was still dark, so it must have come out of a nest. And yes, I found uh, the nest, the quail nest, which was a real bonus. Um, I did find the outcrop, okay, uh, and millions of mozzies found me at the same time, unfortunately. Um, and, um, and the second, out, uh, second outcrop, site 30, um, I had difficulty finding because in the, um, uh, what was that, about three weeks since I'd been there with the rain, the grass had grown and in the dark I had real difficulty finding. I'm glad I had the GPS. So back to Brisbane. Oh, for me, Warwick actually. Okay. So back home to Warwick and I started looking at samples, okay, uh, in detail, particularly the funny green sandstone. Okay. And then got a shock because there's complex plant fossils in it. Now I know they're complex. Can everyone see the line through there? And there's another line there. That's a node on the stalk of a horsetail where the whirl of leaves come out. And also this area down here shows some flome elements uh, where the um, where the sugars and other nutrients move up and down. This is a vascular plant. And I've got a problem. <clears throat> Here's the geological, simplified geological time scale. Okay. The marine sediments that I'm talking about fit about here, about 470 million years old. Complex plants, vascular plants, first appeared on Earth in the Pennsylvanian. And I can shoot myself in the foot and say to all the professional world, hey, I found vascular plants 175 million years before anybody else on Earth. And I shoot myself in the foot. Okay, so um, I've got a paradox. Now, paradox, a paradox, a most unusual paradox. Uh, apologies to Gilbert and Sullivan. So I had, on the one hand, 470 million year old marine fossils looking like they're deposited exactly the same time at uh, um, other rocks which uh, could not be any, um, any younger, any older than 175 million years after that. So I had to look again. So I did look again in 2008. Um, Don decided that he hadn't collected enough information uh, to write the paper. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't uh, put my name to any writings unless I could clear up the paradox because it was, um, it was a real problem for geology in that area. So in 2008, I decided that uh, I'd take a trip in the winter um, and uh, David Flood, uh, ex-member of RGSQ went me, uh, some of you would remember him from Pangelina. Uh, bear David in, um, in your thoughts, um, he's uh, very ill and got only a few months to live. So um, uh, yeah, bear him in mind. Um, so <clears throat> that's an outcrop. It doesn't look of, of a funny green sandstone. Uh, it doesn't look much. And even more so, it doesn't look very much when you look at enhanced specimen, except for those few specimens with the plant fossils. And that's what I went back to, um, uh, that's what I went back to clear up. Okay, so here's a map of, oh, aerial photograph of, um, of Craven's Peak, the southeast end. You can see Craven's Peak Station there, set, uh, it's up on a ridge. Uh, and you can see the creek to the east. Okay, that's where most of the um, most of the rocks that uh, I'm interested in were. The blue uh, are the approximate uh, property boundaries, um, with uh, uh, Ormiston Station, Glen Ormiston Station to the east, and Carlo Station to the south. Um, the boundaries are quite approximate. Okay, and 
I had to work out before I went because I knew there were only the two of us and we had a, a limited time. I had to work out a fairly efficient way to figure out what was going on. Now, the area to the west of that line is sand dunes. Uh, not much good apart from around sand dune bore. There's a bit of uh, um, a bit of um, exposure, but um, uh, it's useless for geology, particularly geology that uh, because it's all covered in sand. Um, the um, the ridge on top of which um, Craven's Peak Station sits is Carlo Sandstone. Uh, it's barren. It's quite uninteresting. Um, and so I didn't want to go there either. Uh, I wanted to go into the Nora Formation. Uh, the area to the east is in Glen Ormiston is um, pretty well covered uh, by sand plains and sand dunes. I had permission to survey into Glen Ormiston, um, but uh, I didn't think it was worthwhile anyway because I, the, the outcrop would be very sporadic. And so therefore, that's the area I'm interested in. Um, now, um, I had to plan the search to be most efficient. I decided to put my traverses mainly east-west for, east for ease of navigation. And so therefore, I, uh, I'll start at Craven's Peak uh, at the station and I'll go due east. Visibility is about 300 to 400 metres. So I decided to put uh, to step out my traverses uh, about uh, 500 metres apart. So we were still close enough together uh, for safety, but we could um, so, but we could also say, hey, come and have a look at this. We had, we had handheld uh, UHF for safety ourselves, and we'd slave those to the UHF in the vehicle so that the, um, uh, and it was rebroadcasting, so people back at Craven's Peak Station uh, could hear on the UHF if, any, if there was any problems. Um, so um, we could say, hey, come and have a look at this, and we could converse. Okay, and so therefore I um, can step. Oh, what did I do? I went backwards, did I? Okay, um, I stepped up so that I was about 500 metres apart, and because it, it's an oblique outcrop, I stepped it forward. Now I could do this all mathematically. I knew where the area I had to cover, and so therefore I could actually plot the, the turning points and calculate them mathematically and step backwards and forwards in what's called a raster plan, a raster search. Okay, and ended up with a search that looks like that. Okay, um, now the thing about that of course is that I wasn't just dealing with one person and so therefore I had to um, keep the two of us close enough together for safety and so therefore what I did is I nested two rasters. And the good thing about this is I can calculate this, I can do it on my computer, and I can download all of those turning points straight from the computer into the GPS. No problems at all, and the GPS uh, and turn it into a route, and it'll keep me on track. Of course, uh, geology is a little bit more, makes things a little bit more difficult because all the stuff you want to see isn't just on the route, so you have to deviate, but it's still, if the route is on your GPS, it allows you to come back to it and, and uh, from where you stepped off. And so I nested the rasters, okay? And then, okay, there's the search pattern that I developed before we went to, to Craven's Peak um, for, um, uh, for uh, to cover that area in detail. And the green sandstone appeared at more or less random. Uh, in that area as well. So I'd pick it, pick it up and be able to plot where it was. Okay, so we start. Okay, first day, I found a trilobite pygidium. And there's the tail of the pygidium with the, with the red dot on it at the moment. Okay, that's quite a small one. It's only about yay big, it's called Proteus. But if you look at the arthropod plate right beside it, that's from the abdomen of another trilobite, a much, much larger one. Okay, didn't find any other 
um, any other evidence, but at least I found an actual body fossil of a trilobite, not just traces. So that was really good. Okay, so um, we went, uh, we went and did the, um, the those um, those surveys. Um, another of my um, scenic lunch spots, and a third. Um, and one of the things that I kept coming up with is this strange fossil. It's so um, it's it's so obvious, and it's, there's not just one of them. There, there's there's multiple of these. There are lots of these, and I'd seen them before in rocks that came from Alice Springs of similar age, but nobody has to this day ever been able to suggest what sort of animal it might be. I thought it might be uh, one of those worms that you find in sand and it's putting some sort of uh, feeding mechanism out to grab stuff at the, at the entry to the burrow. But there's no obvious burrow in the middle of that radiating fan shape. So that one, uh, ge in geology, we still have lots and lots of, um, of enigmas. Okay, so the last day, and by this stage, um, we've been we've been doing twenty to twenty five kilometers a day, and over stony ground, it's really tiring. So I planned this uh, as two half days, uh, the the fifth day for two half days, uh, and that's what I planned. Anyway, towards the end of my last traverse, I came in on a gully. And there's massive outcrop all the way up. Fabulous. More outcrop than I'd seen anywhere else on Craven's Peak. Okay. And the um and the um and the gully is there. I've circled it, right? Uh found it because I had I had to move around. Well, I didn't have to, but I'd seen a little bit of outcrop in the in the mouth of the gully and thought it was worth looking at. So at that stage, it was lunchtime. And um, yes, the last in my series of um, scenic lunch spots. Okay, okay. And then went back to the gully <laughs> and the outcrop is extensive. Lots of Craven A at the top, uh, lots of, sorry, Carlo sandstone on the top, which I uh, conveniently forgot about. Lots of Craven A uh, down in the gully and continuous and the, Question marks are because I didn't survey there. I don't actually. I don't actually know what the information is there. Uh, lots of Craven. Uh, sorry, Craven C, then Craven B, and then Craven A. And with um, with the um, information from other points, I was able to get enough detail to do what's called a measured section. And the only reason I could do that is that I realized that the vertical accuracy of a GPS is much, much less than the horizontal accuracy. But you can improve that by what's called waypoint averaging. You put your GPS down, you hit, you say average this waypoint, and it looks for constellations of satellites, lots and lots of them, and gradually using the different sets of, of satellites, it gets a more and more and more accurate. Um, fix. And so therefore, I was hopefully able to get the, um, uh, I, I was able to get the horizontal accuracy down to about 10 centimetres, which in 2007 wasn't too bad, um, and the vertical accuracy about half a metre, which um, is pretty good um, for GPS. But what I could do, I could start at the bottom of the Craven A, and various places I could actually get really, really good uh, descriptions of the rocks and how they varied, um, uh, how the uh, fossils varied. Uh, I could give um, GPS coordinates for where these particular, um, particular examples are, working up through the Craven A, then into the Coquinite of Craven B, and on the report, these are actually on the same page, but for this purpose, I've put them on two halves, and then we're back to the red uh, sandstone shales of Craven of Craven Sea uh, with Carlo sandstone above. But 
that so being able to do that measured section was a direct result of me being able to increase the accuracy of the GPS by this waypoint averaging technique. Okay, so plonking all my, when I, when I got home, plonking all my points, um, multicolored, uh, so it looks good, um, uh, but uh, color coded so it's easy to look. It fitted the existing 1960s geological, um, um, geological uh, sheet very well indeed and actually added an enormous amount of extra detail in the where the various boundaries are and it's by plotting it it's sorted out what was going on with the funny green sandstone and i didn't have to shoot myself in the foot academically okay what had happened is 470 million years ago a shallow marine nice gentle sedimentation with all those marine fossils that I've already described. Then lots of stuff on top, but we don't know what was there because it's all been eroded off since. About 270 million years ago, a dirty great river gouges a gorge through these existing marine sediments. And there must have been one massive flood because it comes in, it drops the sandstone and all this mashed up plant material as though it's horizontal with the marine stuff. It looks like it's the same, same strata. And then everything's slightly moved, but not so badly that I can't identify what was happening. And so we say goodbye to Craven's Peak. But the learning curve over the two years was enormous. I figured out that a GPS could record a route while traveling. I, could, I learned that a GPS could then follow that pre-recorded route. I recorded my first data points. I set up a route to take other people to those data points uh, with my GPS. I found that GPS routes are incredibly accurate. I was able to accurately plot my data points from my GPS to pre-existing um, pre maps so I could link up that information and my information and I could extrapolate from data points past where I could find outcrop and then find more outcrop of the same rock further on after I'd passed through the sand plain and the sand dune. In 2008, after identifying the area of interest, I could plan mathematically a very efficient search pattern. I could transfer that search pattern directly from my computer to my GPS and turn it into a route on my GPS, which allowed me to follow and efficiently search a, a, a designated area. The plotting of a color-coded data allowed easy representation directly from the GPS onto, uh, onto other maps. And the waypoint averaging enhanced the accuracy of the GPS, particularly vertical, to allow the accurate measurement of that sequence of rocks. A really steep learning curve over the two years. So that particular learning curve finished in 2008. And as a result of that, I was able to write the paper for the monograph. Um, and that was interesting. Um, but it belies, it belies the amount of learning that goes into a new, uh, a new set of skills. So some of you would have been here for the mapping uh, when I um, displayed how I do my mapping for Orienteering Australia. Uh, uh, I did, what I didn't say is that most of the, many of the skills that I use in my mapping today are, um, uh, were learned at Craven's Peak. So this is my most recent map. 
Um, it's halfway between Warwick and um, and Dalveen uh, on the western side of the old Stanthorpe Road. Um, and I completed it in September last year. Um, <clears throat> actually, it's been really good over COVID because um, I can get out in the bush, bush and do my mapping and I, I, I can call it extreme social distancing. Um, <laughs> uh, I've chosen the northwest corner of the map um, to, uh, uh, as an example, to show my uh, how I now use my GPS. Um, and um, I've produced a working copy from way, way back with the GPS markings still on the map before I take them off and just leave the um, and just leave the uh, uh, the um, uh, the orienteering stuff. Now, I'm going to particularly concentrate on that far northwest corner of the map. OK, so the symbology. OK, that's a fence. That's a track. This is a contour and a form line. This is open grassland. This is the white is a uh, runnable forest. Um, this is runnable forest with low undergrowth. The stuff you can sort of see over, it was lantana actually. Um, uh, so you can see over, so you can see a route through. So it's scattered clumps of, um, scattered clumps of uh, lantana. And uh, this, is the lantana is so high and so thick that you can't see over it, so it's walk. Okay, so we have uh, we have four types of vegetation: open, open runnable forest, walk, and fight. Stupid if you go there. <laughs> and so we don't show vegetation types; we show we show vegetation thickness, so that the runners can actually choose their routes. They don't get; uh, they have to choose that for themselves. Okay, <clears throat> so um, what are the uh, what are the results of my learning curve at Craven, Craven Speed? The red crosses are my waypoints, my points of interest, and you'll see that each one there um, has a number. And so, therefore, number 330, 336 there, it's a, it's a boulder cluster, a cluster of big boulders which look like boulders there, but they're all too close together to adequately put on a map. Okay. But um, but uh, my field notes would read 336, okay, a little bit of shorthand there in the field, okay, which reads three th uh, waypoint number 336, boulder cluster, low undergrowth, okay? So I know exactly what to plot on that point. And the one up here, okay, at uh, uh, 354, I think it is, up here, okay, would go uh, the... Uh, UG, which is boulder low undergrowth. Okay, so uh, and there, in that way, there would have been uh, other nominations uh, such as um, uh, two other boulders at five meters uh, either side across slope or something like that. I can't remember now. Okay, so that's the waypoints. Okay, these are tracks. So I set up GPS. Oh yes, okay. There's a line feature. Uh, it might be curved, but it's still a line feature. And I just walk along and it me and it memorizes my track. And so therefore, this one for over here, of course, over there, I've got track 1049 walk. Okay, so therefore you can see the GPS nomination. It was taken in 2021, uh, August the 13th. And I look, and I saved that particular track at 10:49, and I just use the 10:49 as the name of the track. Okay, and all I need to do then, my my CAD software will turn that into an actual area without any problem. So, okay, and the other one over, um, over there, uh, T0918. W slash L U G, yeah, walk, lower ground, lower, uh, low under, uh, undergrowth boundary. And that's uh, this boundary up here. But up at the top corner here, that's one of the corner points. That's one of nine datum points that I, I make sure I'm really, really accurate and I visit a number of times. And I use the waypoint uh, averaging technique that I first learned on that last day in um, Craven's Peak, 
to give me a really accurate uh, datum point so that all the rest of the data that I take during uh, the day's mapping can be placed relative to each other in exactly the right spots, okay? Because absolute accuracy in orienteering isn't actually important. Orienteering maps are not accurate like that. Hopefully, they are pretty accurate, but they have to, things have to be relatively in the right spot so a runner will see what he expects to see with things spaced accordingly. And if you have to modify the scale a little bit to fit things in, then you do that. So it's not absolutely accurate. It just has to be relatively accurate. But um, this is only the, um, only the simplest part, okay, of what, I, uh, of what I've learned, okay? I need to walk slowly through the bush to make sure that I see everything, whether I put it on the map or not, whether it's a small boulder um, uh, or a small lot of bare rock and a runner wouldn't actually see that sort of detail and it doesn't go on the map, doesn't matter. I need to see everything. And so while mapping, I see lots of stuff. That's a bearded orchid. This is a native clematis. Uh, it's called headache vine. Now, I'm not exactly sure whether uh, the Aboriginals used it as a cure for headache or whether the pungent aroma gives you the headache, uh, but it's all over the place. Uh, this is a donkey orchid. Uh, this is one of the more unusual stack houses. Uh, this is one of the Swainstoners. I'm not sure which, but that's what the, the bloom looks like. Okay. There are sandy, uh, at the moment, wet areas for after the last three years all over this site, and they are absolutely covered with these little things called fairy aprons, okay? There are massive uh, staghorns all over the place, and even larger carpet snakes. Some of the wildlife is a little shy. And this, is skeleton fork fern, Silotum nudum. I've only, it's quite rare. Um, I've only ever seen it once before in the crook of a big old tree on the African tableland, but I found it here. So by going to Craven's Peak, by learning the skills of using a GPS, I've gained a lot more than just those skills, a lot more than just pressing the buttons on this little thing we call a GPS. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Yeah. Um, Were you able to set your GPS to the old time datum on the on the map? Because the if you were using a 1960s map, your uh, and modern datums. Uh, you, you would have been a, a fair way out. You wouldn't have got within 10 centimetres. I have, to, I have to plead guilty here. Um, my daughter's an engineer. Uh, she's a flood engineer. Uh, and, uh, and she has very, very capable uh, CAD. Uh, and she, did, uh, she actually uh, didn't do anything with my GPS points. She actually recalibrated the entire map for me. So she moved it to the modern coordinates. In fact, I've had, had to do the same because my original, uh, um, my orienteering mapping uh, and the Craven's Peak mapping was all done on the, 90, the 1984 datum. And most recently, I've had to update that and buy a new GPS because my G new GPS, my old GPS, wouldn't take the new datum. So, yes, yes. Uh, well, I've worked a little bit differently, but. Uh go to uh, fence, boundary fence corner posts, get a GPS point, uh, give those to the cartographer who does the, rec who does the yes. rectification and fits it in properly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm, I've been lucky I haven't had, actually had to do very much of that because um, in, um, uh, in orienteering, as I said, yeah. the absolute accuracy is really only important when you're doing the mapping. Okay, to make sure that's as accurate as possible, and then, uh, and then you modify where things are slightly so that they look right, and that's about it. Okay.
Oh, modern GPS, because you're talking about 15 years ago. You mentioned a moment ago that you bought a new GPS machine. Two, actually, yes. Yeah. So in buying the more recent machines, how much has it changed on that 15? Oh, I have a sight. Um, the, um, uh, on the Magellan that I borrowed from, um, from the fellow Billings, um, I could get waypoints, I could get routes, um, and it had a very limited memory. Um, and that's why I really uh, approached Keith Hall because I was getting worried about how the memory was filling up. With the next, with the first GPS that I bought for the 2008, um, I could then have tracks. Um, it also had a small screen which allowed me then to show the routes uh, uh, with a background map as well. Um, and so therefore that's only in 12 months or so uh, because, well, actually um, uh, the one I had, the Magellan I had, was actually a fairly top of the range one for that time, whereas the one that I bought was about middle of the range. I couldn't... Um, I couldn't afford a couple of thousand dollars for a top of the range one in 2008. But then um, the, uh, the, the other reason that um, I had to buy a, a, a recently a second, um, second uh, GPS was the original one wouldn't take uh, the update in the Australian datum, but also the new computer I bought was 64 bit and the old uh, GPS was 32 bit and they didn't talk to each other. So, <laughs> so I'm there out mapping with my original one and trying to put it into the new computer, but it's not computing. And uh, yeah, uh, that was that was a nightmare for a, a month or so until I figured out what was going on. But yes, the things that you can now do. Um, so, for instance, um, uh, I can now, the amount of memory on the thing is fabulous because I can now go out, do a day's mapping, um, show that, uh, um, dump a, um, uh, a KM, KMZ file, uh, a, a Google Earth file onto my, um, onto my GPS with the mapping. Uh, uh, when I go the next day mapping and walk directly to the previous spot, and oh yes, that contour seems to line up. That um, that um, that rock um, feature is there. Okay, and take it from there, so I can immediately see that I'm in the right spot. And my, then my mapping from there merges seamlessly with what's been done on previous days. So yes, yeah. The only the only problem I've had is when you tile the KMZ files, they don't always match up exactly. And I've never been able to solve that problem. I think that's a, I think that's a CAD problem, not a GPS problem. But we yep. might call it quits there, Stuart, what? and let um, anybody have got any other questions, questions after over a couple of oh, minutes. Yes. Uh, but if I could ask John to come up briefly, please. Hmm. Most interesting. Wish I'd gone to great and sleep, though. Well, that oh. must have been awfully hot. Yeah. It was that. <laughs> John. All right. Well, thanks, Stuart, for a very interesting presentation. Oh. For those of us who were there, it uh, brings back many fond memories. And I, particularly at this point, would like to acknowledge Paul Feeney, who. Oh, I have seen you there, Paul. Organised. Plan led that entire expedition. Yes. And without his input, it would never have happened. The society over the years put on a lot of scientific studies, and that was just one of them. <laughs> Usually going to quite remote locations and facilitating work by scientists in environments they would have had great difficulty accessing on their own. So I think we contributed a lot to scientific knowledge within Queensland and beyond, not much beyond, but a little bit beyond, over a period of many years. And that is 
one of the significant achievements of this society. But from a personal point of view, the ability to go on those studies as a volunteer and work with scientists who in the vein are most passionate about what they do, but no one else seems to be terribly interested, was a very rewarding experience. And I think Stuart's presentation today has probably highlighted the passion of the people who go and do those things in sometimes quite remote and hostile environments. And his ability to dumb it down to, to a level that non-geologists can understand was particularly impressive. So for that, I would like you to join with me in thanking Stuart. Yeah.